Hello, my name is David Scher. I'm back for another lecture in physics, medical health physics. Uh, we've been talking about nuclear medicine. Uh, we uh, Last time we discussed uh, release criteria for patients who've received radioactive material and the NRC regulations dealing with that, and, uh, extensive homework um, uh, dealing with um, with that, and, and today we're going to move on to um, dosimetry in nuclear medicine. Uh, we're going to talk about dosimetry for patients in nuclear medicine. We're going to talk about the um, particular application of uh, pregnant women or women who become pregnant after they've administered radioactive material and uh, concerns related to that, ways to calculate what the, the doses are for that and then uh, turn to occupational dosimetry in nuclear medicine. So um, let's begin. Uh, first, I want to discuss some terms that are important in uh, uh, internal dosimetry. We need to distinguish the intake, the amount of material that's taken into the body, either by inhalation or ingestion, in some cases by skin absorption, in clinical nuclear medicine, it's usually by injection, and so um, the intake is directly to the bloodstream in most cases. Um, next concept is uptake. So of the amount that's uh, the intake we have, um, if it's oral, for example, a certain fraction of that material will be brought into the bloodstream. If it's by inhalation, uh, a, a fraction of the material will be brought in to the circulation um, in the, through the lungs. Uh, in the case of injection, the uptake is equal to the intake. And so the fraction, uptake fraction following an injection is one. Deposition is the uh, amount of material that's incorporated into tissues from circulation. Uh, and that depends a lot on the physiology of the particular compound, the chemical compound involved. And then as materials are, are deposited in, in an organ or tissue, and uh, some of the material is metabolized out of the organ or tissue, a certain amount will reside in that organ or tissue uh, over time. Okay, So the, a simple, very simple model to illustrate this is a one compartment model. Uh, uh, might, for example, be the whole body. A certain amount of material is taken in as a single intake. Some of it is eliminated by physical decay. Some of it is eliminated by biological decay. And so this one compartment model uh, has compartment one with, with two means of, of uh, elimination of material. And so if we look at this model and we consider what's going on, uh, because there are two routes of decay and the amount or, of elimination and the amount of material that's eliminated by each route is proportional to the amount that's present, then we have this leads to an exponential fu function. Generally speaking, almost all compartmental models lead to exponential functions of some form or other, just like um, in um, equilibrium decay, we end up with equal, uh, uh, a series of exponential functions. Uh, in this case, because there are two parallel routes for elimination, we end up with an effective half-life, that's about effective decay constant, that's uh, uh, two decay constants for the two routes. And that gives us an effective half-life that's uh, related to the effective decay life. Um, so the effective half-life is a product of the physical and biological half-lives divided by the sum. Uh, we've done this before, I think, in other applications, and so it should be familiar. Um, in this one, this compartment, we then want to look at the cumulative activity, how many decays take place over the course of time in that uh, activity, in that compartment. Um, so uh, compartment one follows this function, A0 e to the minus lambda t. So an F1 is the fraction that's taken up. That was one for the case of injection. So A0 e to the minus lambda t. We look at that, how much is time, and it turns out that this is the uh, result of that equation. Fairly uh, 
simple uh, functional form. Um, it's always the activity times the fraction that's taken up, one in this case, divided by the decay parameter. So that's the mean life. One over the decay parameter is the mean life, how long uh, on average material remains present in the tissue. And the, the bracket on the right says that over time, uh, uh, if we don't wait until all time through infinity, then uh, a, a portion of it will still remain radioactive after the time we consider, and it will not be counted. Now, we had a one-compartment model. Now we're looking at a three-compartment model. It's to show that it's a little bit more complex. Uh, in this case, we have material that uh, is taken up through the blood, might be by injection, might be from the intestines or from the lungs but the material is taken up through the blood. This is a three compartment model for the um, for iodine metabolism in, in this case. Some of it's gonna be eliminated in the Europe and the urine. Some of it's gonna be taken into the thyroid and some of it's gonna be taken into the rest of the body. Uh, or as, uh, it will be released from the thyroid as thyroxin. It will be uh, sent to the rest of the body. Some might be eliminated by pieces. Some might be recirculated into the blood. Uh, and so we end up with a more complicated um, a set of equations that you see at the bottom, uh, but it's still, the, the results are all still exponentials. And it, it, it's, it's tractable. It's something that can't be handled. Uh, here are more complicated models. The one on the left is a more thorough model of iodine-131 sodium iodide. Uh, and so it has different chemical forms. Some of it is in the thyroid and uh, might be held for a while. Well, compartment one is the iodine pool that is in the blood, circulating the blood. Uh, it can go to urine, it can go to the salivary glands, the stomach and you know, stomach contents. Many, many compartments that you can see it becomes more complicated. The one on the right is a, a kinetic model for fluorine 18 in sugar, fluorine deoxid, uh, deoxyglucose. Uh, the blood uh, from the, uh, the F18 injected into the blood it can circulate into or be transferred into many different organs, just as blood always is. The sugar is, is taken up and used by those uh, organs. Um, the amount of sugar that's taken up is an indication of the metabolic activity. Some of the material is taken, uh, transferred through the kidneys and re removed through the bladder. So this, you can see that all the, the physiological parameters that take place about the movement of the agent involved, the, the radio labeled sodium iodide or the radio labeled glucose, um, all that's reflected in the, the metabolic or biokinetic model. Uh, the next tool that's used is a computational phantom that's used for calculations for um, internal dosimetry. They are 3D models that mathematically re represent the human body. They uh, are supposed to reflect all of the uh, complex anatomy and uh, material composition of the body. Um, so we have a 3D voxel array. So the, the, the space is three-dimensional space is broken up into little units called voxels, uh, volume elements. Um, and, and then each voxel is assigned to either be a part of the organ of, of the lungs, a part of the bladder, it's assigned to the liver, it's assigned to the brain, whatever organ it is and its properties are recorded. Um, they can be either very simplified models, like the one on the, the top, very geometrical and easy to compute, or they can be more realistic, like the ones on the bottom. They can reflect different ages and sizes, which would have a big con uh, effect on the, the radiation doses um, that would come out of it. Um, and, but they're used, what, what the, the phantom uh, models are used for is to, uh, model the radiation transport. So we've already got all the information from our biokinetic model about where the radioactivity is in the, the, the body. Now, well, let's move on to the next slide and I'll explain this. So we have uh, radioactive material that's uh, by our biokinetic model, we know that it's present in certain tissues. And so in this case, there's radioactivity um, present in the thyroid. The, the radioactivity in the thyroid can irradiate other organs Radioactivity that's distributed in, in many organs can irradiate the organ itself, and it can irradiate neighboring organs. So 
the um, these mo mathematical models are used to calculate if I have a, a, a photon of a certain energy, 100 keV, how much of that uh, 100 keV, it, it, and it's assigned to this organ, the the uh, liver, say, how much of this organ is uh, how much uh, how much of that energy is is then irrad irradiates the lung, how much of that energy irradiates the brain, how much of that en energy irradiates the kidneys, and uh, we calculate how much of the what fraction of en of the energy would transport to a, a neighboring or all these neighboring organs uh, for a given for each photon that's emitted. We do that for 100 kV, do that for 200 kV, do it for all the different energies that are present. And then we have a table that tells us if there are, for each photon emitted from organ, from a source organ, what is a fraction that's absorbed in a target organ? The absorbed fractions. This is all the computation that's done uh, for every energy of every kind of radiation. Uh, in in these uh, uh, phantom patients, lots of computer time necessary to do that. It's done as a Monte Carlo calculation, so it, it doesn't really matter what the details are. Um, so we calculate these five for uh, for each energy I from every source organ to every target organ. Now, it, it's, it may seem obvious if you think about it for a little bit, but for charged particles, the assumption is that all the energy of the charged particle is absorbed in the organ, and none of it is uh, makes its way to other organs. So uh, the absorbed fraction for charged particles is one. If uh, uh, it, the, tor the source organ is the same as the target organ, and it's zero otherwise. So there's one other parameter that is related to the anatomy that's uh, modeled in the, these models, and that is the mass of the target organ. Remember that the absorbed dose we're interested in is going to be the energy divided by the mass of whatever's absorbing the energy. So we take, we come up with the, instead of the absorbed fraction, it's the specific absorbed fraction, and that is the, uh, the fraction of energy that is absorbed by a target organ divided by the mass of the target organ. That'll help us in our calculation for dose later on. So we put these all together with this in the skirt, uh, the MERD schema, the MERD approach. MERD is medical isotope um, radiation dosimetry. It's a, it was a committee of the Society of Nuclear Medicine that developed these techniques. The same techniques are used by the ICRP and its calculations of um, uh, dose efficiency. And so this is just the standard way that we, we do these. So we have the biokinetic data that gave us the cumulative activity uh, for each of the organs for, for a, a certain isotope. We know how much of, of, of the decays take place in each organ for whatever the agent is that's administered. Um, all the radiological data uh, is, is used for this as well. That shows up in this delta here. It's the K. We've used that constant. Uh, the constant it is a, a unit transformation. It's uh, the E is represented in MEV, and so and the mass that we had was represented in grams. So we have to have a, a constant to convert MEV per gram to a joule per kilogram, and the value of K is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. Y is the yield. It's the uh, fraction K. Uh, what percentage go in, goes into radiation I with energy EI? So there might be many. Uh, for, for a given isotope, there might be many uh, radiations with different energies, and there'll be a, um, a yield for each one of them. Now, our phantom model gave us our transport uh, information about radiation. That's all shows up in the specific absorbed fraction that we just talked about a moment ago. And these all together make up our uh, uh, dose. So the energy that's emitted right here, for each uh, different radiation times the, the uh, fraction that moves from the source organ to the target organ. And we add that up over all the source organs. Uh, we multiply 
how many decays took place in the source organ, and that gives us the amount of dose from the source organ to the target organ. <clears throat> if we add up all the different source organs, then we get the dose to the target organ. So it's a straightforward process. Now, I will tell you that practicing health physicists don't do these calculations. In fact, I think that's my next slide. Word schema. Oh, well, I'll just say, before I say that, uh, what, what how practicing health physicists do is they look up these results in a table. All this merge schema, that's used to, to do the computations to give us useful results that are coefficients in a dose coefficient table. In this case, we're talking about, the, I've, I've gone to New Reg 6345. It was published in 1996. I got an example for F18 FDG. So this is the, the sugar molecule. It's labeled with, with foreign 18. It's a PET isotope. It's a positron emitter. So everything we did here is proportional to the activity administered. So uh, what we have here are, uh, we divide out the original uh, initial activity and we decide, we have here table to tell us what the absorbed dose is for each uh, becquerel, mega becquerel or for each millicurie of activity whether it's in traditional or uh, SI units. So for each mega becquerel of F18 F FTG administered, then 1.3% uh, of it shows up in the adrenals. 1.9% of, well, well, one, excuse me, it's 1.013 uh, mega becquerel, uh, mega milligray occur for each mega becquerel. 1.3 milligray per megabecquerel. For the brain, 1 point, uh, 0.019 milligray per megabecquerel to the brain, et cetera. Every tissue. We, we know what the what fraction, what, what the dose will be for each megabecquerel. We've also got the, the um, effective dose equivalent listed here. Effective dose equivalent is where we take all the different tissues and multiply by the tissue weighting factor for all the organ doses and add them all up. This kind of information is available, for example, in New Reg 6345, but for each radioactive drug, it's part of the package insert that comes with the drug and, and they're available online. So you can get it from the manufacturer as well. It has all of the, the dosimetry um, available. So this I show you is from 1996. There can be more recent information, and that's what I'm going to present here. Um, there are many places to obtain up-to-date information. The ICRP is publishing new values of, of uh, internal dose data all the time. Uh, one from a few years ago, ICRP 128, has a compendium of radio pharmaceuticals, uh, radiation dose factors. In ICRP 128, they not only have one column that represents the adult phantom, but they have columns that represent phantoms of different sizes. So they have one column for the uh, adult, one column for the 15-year-old, a column for the 10-year-old. So they have dose conversion factors for all these different phantoms that are published in ICRP 128. Uh, there are um, values that are available from journals. So a few years later than ICRP-128, there's a, a, a pendium, a list of, of dose conversion factors for different agents published by Staben and Siegel in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. I'll give you the reference here. Also get recent information uh, uh, from the, the manufacturers of the pharmaceutical site. This uh, source of information from uh, this website that Dr. Staben uh, operates uh, that provides uh, information, a um, wide variety of information, of, 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 of a lot of different kinds of information about radiation dosimetry, particularly for in the context of nuclear medicine. Let's see, so, but now, as I was saying, health physicists in the field don't use all this computational techniques. They, we don't go 
and look up the radiometric data. We don't calculate the specific absorbed fractions. We don't, um, uh, you know, go through that whole process. That, that's done by experts and, and compiled to the tables. But why do I present the information to you? Is it just to be interesting and, and make for scintillating conversation? Well, no, this is important for practicing health physicists to understand so that you understand the assumptions that are involved, so that you can uh, uh, know when you're departing from those assumptions, you can understand the, the complexity that's involved, and in some cases you can make adjustments because if you understand the, the models that are being used, you can you can know how to adjust the parameters and and, and modify the the dose coefficients uh, and understand the literature that you're reading. That's the reason it's beneficial. So um, this internal dosimetry practice uh, information, is, these techniques are useful in uh, clinical applications um, so from time to time. Uh, just in an ordinary diagnostic exam, a patient will be concerned about the radiation exposure. If a child needs to have a nuclear medicine scan, the parents might be concerned about the radiation exposure. And so being able to quantify the exposure to the patient can be helpful uh, for um, in uh, theranostics, where we're doing a therapeutic uh, uh, work with an agent that can be imaged as well to track the progress of therapy, um, then uh, we need to do, we use the, the techniques uh, to estimate what the radiation dose will be to the patient. Uh, we use the, the results of, of the uh, MERG calculations to estimate what the dose will be to the various organs so that we can maximize the dose to the, the um, treatment volume, the, the, the and it needs to be treated and minimize the dose to the rest of the patient. There is a computer program called Olinda EXM that does these kind of calculations on an individual patient basis. You can modify or organ masses. You can modify the kinetic parameters that are involved based on observations from scans of the patient and come up with a realistic dose to an individual patient, not just the population averages that we have in the tables. Um, sometimes fetal dose estimates are important. So sometimes you'll find that uh, a person who's pregnant, pregnant women still have health problems. And sometimes it's still necessary for uh, pregnant women to undergo uh, nuclear medicine scans to protect their own lives. And so uh, there might be a need to prospectively estimate the dose to a fetus as a result of a, a CT, uh, a nuclear medicine study, so that the woman can know, so everyone can make an informed decision about balancing risks and benefits. Uh, sometimes the field dose estimates are occur, occur in retrospect. So a, a patient may deny being maybe negative on a pregnancy test and undergo a nuclear medicine study and then find out later they were pregnant at the time of the study. And at that point, we need to evaluate what the doses were and what the risks were to the patient. So that's um, another place where this uh, takes place. Uh, and sometimes a pregnant, a, a patient therapy, and then at some time after that, they become pregnant. Now, women are advised to not become pregnant for eight weeks following a um, iodine therapy, for example, uh, to avoid these risks, but accidents happen. And so at that point, it's important and maybe necessary to evaluate what the, the dose to the fetus will be from the residual activity that still remains after the, the, the scan is over. And so those are applications where we uh, might need to, to use internal dosimetry in a clinical setting uh, to help uh, with the, the patient with the clinical concerns. Um, so let's talk a little bit about doses administered during pregnancy, since we're talking about nuclear medicine dosimetry. Um, th so th I'm gonna uh, briefly speak about the consequences of radiation dose uh, during pregnancy to the, the fetus, the, the, the baby in, in gestation. Um, 
So the risks related to that are dependent on two uh, parameters. One is the scale of the absorbed dose, and the other is the stage of development, how far along the pregnancy is. The most significant risks occur early on and during ergogenesis. I'll discuss that in a minute. And those are both in the first trimester. The, the baby is less sensitive to radiation later in the pregnancy. Um, so the effects that are observed or that we're going to talk about are tissue reactions. That is their non-stochastic effect. And they have a threshold. The stochastic effect that we'll talk about is induction of leukemia and other cancers. And that doesn't appear to have a threshold. Um, or it's not known that there's a threshold. Um, tissue reactions that we're going to talk about all have a threshold of about 100 to 200 milligray. So that's a, a, an extensive, do a high dose. That's 10 to 20 rem. Um, and that's more than the dose that's typically associated with diagnostic exams. And so um, uh, part of this is to gather the information so we know what the dose is. And then part of it is to communicate to the people involved what the dose is and a sense of what the magnitude of the risk is that's associated with that. Um, references that provide information about risks during pregnancy are ICRP Report 84 and NCRP Report 174. I've gathered some of the information from those reports. Um, they're both available online. And uh, uh, if you find yourself in this situation or you want additional information, I'd recommend uh, using those resources to educate. So in the earliest part of pregnancy, during the first couple of weeks, the most likely outcome of a radiation damage will be loss of the pregnancy. So there appears to be, uh, empirically, there's an all or none phenomenon uh, in this case. So at the very earliest stage, if there's damage done to the zygote or the uh, um, consepsis, uh, it will, um, the damage will result in it not properly implanting. Okay. Uh, so children who are, are born, who, have, who were exposed to radiation at, uh, uh, in the first two weeks of pregnancy have, uh, for example, in the atomic bomb study, uh, they, there was no observation of increased congenital malformation other diminished mental capacity or any of the other um, non-stochastic effects. Uh, if the, if the uh, zygote implanted, uh, and uh, then it uh, uh, carried forth to a normal um, pregnancy. Uh, the of pregnancy for um, is about 0.15 to 0.2 gray. We have nothing to compare this to, how frequently this occurs compared to the, the background rate, because when people are pregnant less than two weeks, that's often unrecognized as a pregnancy. And so it's hard to have some background rate of how often uh, this kind of, of non-implantation occurs in the background population. Um, but it's a relatively common effect, even without radiation at all. Now, the next phase, uh, is a period when organs are being formed in the, in the fetus. Um, period is between weeks two and week 18. Uh, risks that are associated with that have to do with uh, malformations, gross malformations, um, growth, miscarriage or stillbirth. Uh, and there appears to be a threshold of about 0.2 gray for, for any of these phenomena. Now here's the, uh, a graph from the NCRP report showing that this stage of development uh, for, for rats, the equivalent stage of development, what, um, how many, what the frequency of uh, malformations was. And you can see that for the same exposure at different time frames, those that were exposed during this period of organogenesis had far more malformations than those who were, who were 
it's what was before or after. And so it really is uh, this, this concern about gross malformations is um, really limited uh, to the period of, of uh, formation. Now, the background rate for uh, major malformations in the general population without uh, any um, radiation is about 3%. The background rate of minor uh, malformations is about 4%. Uh, and the background rate for miscarriage or stillbirth is about 15%. So the, these are common phenomena and a few more occur in the case, or there will be more, I want to characterize as a few, depending on the radiation dose, there can be more uh, than even, but they're, they're not different from what happens uh, in the, the generally without any radiation, at radiation exposure. Now, during the fetal development, there's a period when the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord are being developed. This is during the period from weeks eight to 25. And that's when the, the fetus is most sensitive to injury to the, the, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. The highest uh, risk of injury is during weeks, weeks eight to 15. And the, some of the outcomes that are, can occur from exposure in this period are lowered IQ, diminished mental capacity that is, uh, microcephaly, which is a, a small uh, head, uh, convulsive disorders uh, or um, behavioral problems as a result, result of neuro, neural neurological problems. Um, these graphs, this shows uh, seizure disorders. Uh, these are the point, so we have three different levels of exposure, less than uh, or greater than half a gray, one to 0.49 gray and less than 0.1 gray. And um, these are the different uh, uh, periods when the radiation occurred. So even though, so let's look at the greater than 0.5 gray more than um, 50 rem. Uh, when the exposure occurred during eight to 15 weeks, it was much higher than when the same exposure occurred uh, uh, later in, in the pregnancy or earlier in the pregnancy. So it's it, again, confined to a specific window of time. Uh, this down here shows the risk of uh, severe mental retardation, people of 60, I believe. Um, Here's what the, the, the frequency is for, for different levels of dose. If the uh, exposure occurs um, week seven or before week eight up to week seven and after week uh, 25, then there's no increased incidence. If there's, um, if it occurs eight to 15 weeks, it's the highest increased incidence and 18 to 25, there's a moderate or intermediate level of increased incidence. Okay. Important uh, endpoints, and that's why the understanding the dose and the timing is important. In late pregnancy, after these, as the period of organogenesis, um, the risk of tissue reactions, of the, the things we talked about, is very low, except for very high exposures of order of one gray or higher. Um, however, uh, Increase of cancer is uh, a concern throughout all phases of pregnancy. Uh, there are no um, timing differences for, for cancer, uh, for the endpoint of cancer. Um, the uh, background incidence for childhood cancer is about two to three per thousand. Uh, for those who are exposed to 10 milligray, the increased risk is about 40% above that. Now, 40% of two to three is still a small number, but it's a large fractional increase. And I will say that th this risk estimate remains controversial. Variety um, of opinions, and there's a, a, a section in the NCRP report where the differences, different opinions are expressed um, uh, and the reasons are argued out in the NCRP report. Uh, now, this table that you see here uh, shows um, the uh, doses from different agents. Uh, the dose to the fetus depends on uh, also 
the, so the metabolic model and the radiation transport model is going to be different during pregnancy than for a normal uh, baby. So I think I have a picture here showing, I don't, there it is, showing uh, the, the anthem that's used for different stages of development. You can see that the, the transport is different in these cases. Um, cases, the, uh, the ones in gray here, uh, those agents will pass through the placenta and be incorporated into the fetus. The ones in white, we're talking about exposure that's due to a tissue, uh, um, isotope that's in the, the mother's body that then irradiates the, the fetus. In many cases, the highest level of exposure comes from the urine when it's in the bladder. So the radioactivity is metabolized and then goes to the, into the urine and it remains in the urine for some time before the patient uh, voids. And, and so that will cause uh, the, the, the bladder is fairly close to the fetus. And so there's, that's one source of exposure for the fetus. And so if the patient can uh, urinate more frequently, that will spare dose to the fetus. Okay, but there's again a table. These are all milligray per megabecquerel. So same kind of dose coefficients that we had before. This is dose milligray to the, the fetus per megabecquerel administered to the mother. The, this table is presented in the reference I show here on the left. Um, uh, and it's for different stages of the, fe of the fetal development because that changes the geometry, changes the specific absorbed dose, etc. cetera. Um, where there's a placental crossover where the, the uh, material can be uh, absorbed into the fetus and that contributes. Um, now, pregnancy following, uh, following uh, therapy with iodine-131. So, we're not concerned so much about pregnancy that follows diagnostic nuclear medicine procedures. The half-life that's used for agents that are used for diagnostic studies is very short, six hours for technetium 99 m uh, for some PET isotopes. So uh, two hours, I think, for F18. So um, uh, it's unlikely that the, a woman will become pregnant so soon after having a nuclear medicine scan. But for iodine, the half-life is eight days. And so it can remain in the body for quite some time. As you learn from talking about the, looking into the release criteria, that, that it may take some time before the rate will, will be adequate. Um, okay, uh, so the, the fetal dose is determined by looking at how much activity remains in the body, how it's, uh, metabolized and, and uh, uh, iodine-131 can be passed to the infant as well, to the, to the this as well. And so there are dose coefficient tables that were developed that tell us what the um, dose will be for the activity administered uh, and how many, after uh, how much time. So in this case, this is the table I'm talking about, we have what was the uptake of the patient? So for hyperthyroidism, there's a, could be a very large uptake. 80% um, is not uncommon. That's probably average for hyperthyroid when, uh, peak patients. Um, and, and then for normal thyroid cases, up to say, say 25 or 30% is a common uptake amount. And then after it's decayed, uh, at six, let's, uh, let's say six weeks following administration, here are the, we can figure out what the milligray, the dose to the fetus, per megabecquerel administered to the mother for all these uh, different combinations of times of the uptake they had. So you would have to gather information, to use this, you have to gather information about what was the patient's uptake. It's going to be known uh, for um, because it's part of the clinical workup and then how long has it been after that that the patient became pregnant? And then we can calculate what the dose, uh, how much, how many milligrays were administered, uh, excuse me, how many megabecquerels were administered, we can calculate what the dose to the fetus in milligrays are. are. 
So it's straightforward to do, but it's it, it becomes important. Now I want to move occupational dosimetry. So this is radiation dosimetry for people working in nuclear medicine. Normally, nuclear medicine employees are not exposed to internal contamination. Normally, we're concerned about external exposure. And so this is captured with a film badge or a TLD or other um, monitoring device. Uh, people who work in nuclear medicine frequently wear a whole body badge to monitor their whole body exposure and a ring to monitor their extremity exposure. The reason we need to use extremity uh, monitoring for nuclear medicine is that we often the te technologists will often handle the radioactive material in syringes and, and uh, vials, and so they can have a very high exposure to their hands. Um, in addition, exposures present from these two sources, but the patients themselves uh, will emit radiation that might cause um, exposure to the workers. And so that's another concern. So um, we can reduce the dose. In addition to monitoring the dose, we can reduce the dose techniques by using uh, um, engineered uh, and uh, controls and, and administrative procedures. So this is what's called an L shield. You can see it's shaped like an L. Uh, and so this has attenuating lead glass and attenuating uh, lead shielding to um, provide protection for the worker who stands behind it, reaches around and, and does it in the work with the radioactive material. Then the, the center picture are vial shields. So this is a vial containing a radiopharmaceutical. It's placed into a shield so that uh, the workers will have a lower dose as a consequence of it. It's not zero. They still receive a, 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 an important dose, and so it needs to be stored properly, but um, it's much less than it would be if they didn't have this. In addition, there's a syringe shield shown at the bottom of the slide uh, that is a dense material, sometimes tungsten, which is a very dense material, sometimes other heavy materials uh, that absorb the photons um, so that they don't minimize dose to the technologist. Um, Another thing we can do to minimize exposure from, for example, from patients is have a separate waiting room. So in nuclear medicine, patients, in many cases, patients are uh, in the material, and then there's, it has to be, take some time for it to um, be uh, taken up by the organs that we want to image. And so having a place where they can wait that's away from workers and the public, a separate waiting room, uh, can help um, uh, reduce dose to, to the workers and the public. Uh, especially important for pet patients because the radiation is very penetrating and you can end up with relatively high exposure rates. Um, now let's talk about occupational exposure to internal radionuclides. Uh, this would occur most frequently from airborne activity. And so um, I'm going to use an example. Uh, there are ventilation that uh, check lung function usually a combination of the ventilation and the blood flow into the lungs is studied, looking for pulmonary embolisms. Um, this uh, can be done with technetium 99 labeled to an air, uh, uh, a material DTPA as an aerosol, and that can be um, inhaled in the patient. Another approach is to use Xenon 133 gas. Uh, Krypton has been used as well. Um, so uh, normally the patient breathes this material in and exhales and the, the, the gas is trapped. And, and so it doesn't present a hazard to the workers or the or people in the room. Additionally, iodine 131 is, uh, you can become a volatile agent. Uh, it's used for uh, the uh, thyroid treatment we talked about. Normally it's administered as capsules or frequently it's administered as capsules. And so there's very little off-gassing as a result. It's all contained within the, the capsule. But occasionally liquid form may be needed. Perhaps the patient has difficulty swallowing, and so it has to be administered by a feeding tube uh, or some other reason. Um, and so in, in that case, if the pH is lowered in the iodine, it can be uh, the sodium iodide that can convert the iodide into iodine gas, I2 gas, and then that becomes airborne and can be breathed in by workers and people in the area. In addition, 
even for gases or thing, things where uh, uh, a lot of this work is done in fume hoods, in ventilation control areas, and so that protects the workers as well. But occasionally there can be a release that, that results in airborne activity in a work area. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, bioassay programs. How can we monitor this in the, the exposure on workers to see if they've got any uptake? Well, Xenon 133 is a noble gas. It's not going to accumulate in the body. It's not going to be metabolized. The concern there is external exposure uh, from the gas around them. Um, so that will be uh, monitored with the, the dosimeter, just like other external exposure is. Technesium 99M for DTPA and this uh, uh, aerosol studies uh, has a very short half-life and the alley is enormous. This is not a typo. It's 200 millicuries is the alley. So a very large amount of exposure would be required to result in a dose that's um, occupationally important. Iodine-131, however, has a much lower alley, the annual limit for intake is 50 microcuries to reach the limit for the thyroid. That's a very small amount. And so, um, uh, and there's a potential for exposure to radioactive iodine. Uh, employers use a bioassay program. There's a reg guide, 8.20, that provides guidance on how to do bioassay programs specifically with radioactive iodine because it's very common. Um, Nations in Reg Guide 8.40 are that you should monitor the personnel. If they use more than one millicury of iodine outside of the fume hood or more than 10 millicuries in a fume hood. Uh, and so that can be uh, um, very common in nuclear medicine to use those, those levels of activities. The monitoring consists of measuring radiation coming from the thyroid of a worker and recording that information to see if there's any activity, uh, comparing it with background to see if there's any activity in the thyroid. Frequency of this testing should be done at baseline. So at new employees should be evaluated to make sure that, that you have a, a baseline number uh, to make sure that there are um, Subsequent uh, uh, measurements are actually different. Uh, in addition, there should be periodic monitoring. Typically, it's quarterly. If there's no, you monitor new employees for a while, and if there's no exposures observed, then people end up on a quarterly basis. And finally, uh, these, these to be done, if there's a high level is measured, you need to do follow-up repeated measurements to, to be able to assess what the exposure uh, of that person is, calculate their dose. Um, should be um, uh, bioassay measurements after an emergency. So if there's a spill, you should do um, bioassay measurements following that to see if there was any intake, uptake by the, the uh, workers. And finally, when the people leave employment, you want to do an assay again, bioassay again, to make sure that there was no, you have a, a final record that they did not have any um, uh, iodine uptake while they were in their employment. Part of the record of the program is to make sure the equipment works function uh, functions properly there's some complex de um, complex is maybe a bit strong but you, you need attention to detail to make sure that this is calibrated correctly so that you know you're quantifying any iodine measured precisely you need a, a proper radiation source to calibrate it you need a proper phantom to um, model a, a human neck so that so the, the measurements can be accurately um, we can get the counting efficiency to be accurate uh, now, another possibility, though, is for things that can't be monitored by bioassay, uh, it's possible that, say, a non-reactive gas, like Xenon 133, is released in a room. So we have an accident, and some amount of reactivity is released in a room. How long will that room be dangerous? When will it be uh, safe to return to the room? So I'm going to go through the steps for deriving that answer. and. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So, uh, so then if there's an activity A0 that's released in a room, a vial breaks, a hose disconnects, for whatever reason, whatever that activity is, the concentration in the room is A0 divided by V, where V is the volume of the room. Now, the room is undergoing ventilation. It has air handlers. It has a, a HVAC system. And so the, the, the 
air is being replaced at a rate, a flow rate of some number of cubic meters per minute. And the engineers who, who maintain the system will know what the, the, uh, the, what the flow rate is. Um, now, that means that if the room is volume V and the flow rate is Q in, in cubic meters per minute, then the exchange rate is Q over V. If there's 10, one uh, millicurie per cubic meter and the room, oh, the flow rate is one, one uh, uh, excuse me, one uh, cubic meter per minute of flow rate and there's ten, a thousand cubic meters, then one thousandth of the room is, is exchanged every minute. Um, and so another term you might hear from the, the maintenance people is how many air changes per hour. And if that information is known, it's equivalent to knowing Q over V. The, the, so you can calculate, if they tell you the number of air changes per hour, you can figure out what Q over V is. So the, if there's this kind of exchange taking place, then the concentration will change over time. It'll have its initial concentration, and then there'll be a, a, a de decrease over time that's e to the minus t times q over v. It changes per hour times the amount of time, uh, or per minute. Um, so uh, the time, we can use this equation, set the concentration equal to the DAC, and find out how much time it takes to reach the DAC or some safe level. And that's this formula right here. The time is V over Q times the logarithm of the initial concentration divided by the DAC. And so here's an example. Um, let's say that there's a, a container with Xenon-133, um, a, a gas cylinder or whatever, and uh, the amount that's on hand for nuclear medicine studies is 200 millicuries. That's what we have. And the room we're in is about 16 by 16 by 10. So that's about 30 cubic meters. And if this cylinder with 200 millicuries suddenly releases its contents, the initial concentration will be this activity divided by this volume, which is 6.7 cubic meter or 6,700 microcuries per cubic meter. Back for a xenon-133, it's from a, a submersion that's uh, uh, times 10 to the minus 4 microcuries per ml, which is the same thing as 100 microcuries per cubic meter. So we're doing a calculation with like units. As long as the units are the same, we're good. Um, so the engineers tell us the room has 20 air exchanges per hour. That's 0.33 per minute, and that's our Q over V in our formula, right here. So um, the time it takes to reach the, the DAC is one over the air exchanges divided by, or times the logarithm of the concentration, initial concentration divided by the um, DAC. And it turns out that the time it will take to clear the room is 13 minutes to get to the occupational level. So you might wait a half an hour so you have another level of safety before that, beyond that. So that's what we have for today. I thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm going to move on from here uh, to do uh, some more dosimetry. Um, we've finished what I want to cover in nuclear medicine for operational concerns. We're going to go back and talk about dosimetry for radiography, fluoroscopy, mammography, and radiation oncology, including talking about the, the um, case of pregnancy. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. We'll, after we cover this information, we'll be ready for our second uh, test. Then we have a new segment of, the, of the, our final segment of the course, which is going to be about calculating shielding requirements in hospital environments. So I look forward to working with you on all, all of you on that. And for right now, I bid you a, a, a good day.